Welcome to Upstream, where we make your worldview bigger and older by taking hard questions to the headsprings of Christian wisdom. I'm Shane Morris. What is a woman? Well, lately, that question has become an ideological and cultural flashpoint, thanks in part to a documentary by that name. But the question has been deafeningly implied in cultural developments for the last decade or so. Men like Bruce Jenner appearing on magazines declaring to the world that they are women, HR and campus admins training staff on the genderbred person or the gender unicorn, the rise of ever more confusing lists of pronouns and identities, the entry of men into women's sports and locker rooms, and the mainstreaming of medical mutilation of healthy bodies to affirm invisible psychological self-concepts, even ostracizing of public figures like J.K. Rowling and Camille Paglia who haven't gone along with this process. What has happened exactly? How did gender replace the biological realities of male and female? And how do those of us who think something is badly amiss draw our neighbors and our culture back toward concrete reality to a place where the words man and woman again have actual meaning? Well, joining me today is someone who has a compelling and provocative set of answers to those questions, having personally walked the ideological journey that led our culture to where it is today. Dr. Abigail Favalli is Dean of Humanities and Professor of English at George Fox University. Her award-winning work has appeared in The Atlantic, First Things, Church Life Journal, and other publications. She's the author of a couple of books, most recently, The Genesis of Gender, A Christian Theory, which is what we want to talk about today. Abigail Favalli, welcome to Upstream. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, and a quick update to my bio. I actually just started a job at Notre Dame. So I was at George Fox for the last decade. It's funny that I moved right when the book came out. And so already I have this brand new book and the bio is out of date. So <laughs> that's way worse than my out of date bio on, on a couple of sites like the Gospel Coalition, where it, it, it said for a while that I had three kids. Actually, I have four kids. And, you know, it's yeah, it's like erasure of Aubrey. It's so disappointing. But <laughs> Hopefully the second printing, I'm sure there will be one, but hopefully you can get that fixed. Abigail, this book is as much biographical as it is philosophical. You know, you're making points about uh, cultural trends, about the rise of the concept of gender and how it replaces sex in the imag public imagination and how the role of feminism and birth control and things like that played. But, but this is personal for you because you have your own journey and your own story in this confusing world of ideas. Could you get, like, give us a, the brief version of what your journey looked like, what was driving you and motivating you, and where you ended up as a result of, of that process? Sure. So I grew up an evangelical Christian in the Western United States in kind of the Mormon belt in Eastern Idaho and Utah. And I went to a Christian college, actually George Fox University, where I used to work, was also my alma mater. And in many ways, I was a typical evangelical kid, I think, when I went to college. But I was really interested in the question of women's dignity and the question of women's roles and what God was calling me to do in my personal life, in my professional life. And those questions became really pressing in college. And at the time, I started taking philosophy classes and I became a philosophy major. And I felt like this whole world was opening up. And I started getting really interested in feminist thought, reading feminist bi biblical criticism and feminist philosophy. And I thought, oh, this is where this is where I'll find the answer to all these questions that I have that I hadn't really felt were dealt with, I guess, in my in my tradition growing up. And for a while, I think feminism had a positive effect on my spiritual life. It it helped me regain a sense of deeper dignity in, in the eyes of God. I encountered more of a history of Christian women. I was very familiar with women in the Bible, but I had never really encountered famous Christian women throughout history. So it was this period of discovery. But by the time I graduated, something had shifted. And instead of feminism kind of being a pathway to God, it became kind of a wall between myself and God. At the time, I thought, oh, well, this wall is patriarchy. You know, like, I can't pray, I can't see God because all the patriarchal things that are projected onto him, you know, in air quotes. But looking back, I now kind of realized that initially, you know, Christianity was my religion and I was using resources from feminism to, to complement that. 
But what shifted is that feminism really became my foundation. And then I was looking at Christianity from that foundation. And I had adopted what is called a hermeneutics of suspicion in feminist circles. So a way of reading the world, a way of interpreting the world, the text, certainly the Bible, certainly Christian tradition, through a lens of suspicion and in a spirit of suspicion, like you're kind of on the hunt for sexism, for patriarchy. And that became almost a totalizing lens for me. And what I learned and wasn't totally aware of at the time is that it's it's impossible to to really love God if you're suspicious of him. And so after I graduated, my undergrad years, I went on into graduate school studying feminist philosophy, women writers, gender theory. And so I just kind of cannonballed into the deep end on that. And even though I still considered myself a Christian, it was really just this this kind of abstract intellectual preoccupation with Christianity. I didn't go to church. I didn't pray. There was nothing active about my faith. It was all purely theoretical. And I'd really entered a, a more of a postmodern stance at that point where, and by postmodern, I mean, it's kind of a word that's thrown out around a lot, but basically I would say the the kind of post postmodern stance that I adopted is basically the belief that ultimate truth is unknowable. And so all we have are these human made stories that allow us to try to make sense of the world. And so I saw Christianity as this compelling and beautiful story that had a lot of truth in it, but I no longer saw it as having any th- sort of authoritative role in my life. Therefore, I felt free to kind of keep what I wanted and get rid of what I wanted, right? Then near the end of my 20s, I became a mother for the first time. And that coincided with this escalating spiritual crisis as I, the cognitive dissonance that I was inhabiting as someone who professed to be a Christian, but really had no faith life what to, to speak of. That kind of came to a head. At the same time, I became a mother and the, the explanatory power of feminism began to ebb. And then the grace of God just grabbed me back. That's kind of the only way to tell the story. So um, then I had a, a, a very powerful reversion to Christianity, um, in this case, Catholic Christianity. And once I entered back into Christianity, I had an entire worldview shift, really, from my kind of postmodern feminist worldview. And I was still interested in the same kinds of questions about gender and sexuality and women's dignity. I realized that that quest that I'd had to better understand my dignity as a woman is better fulfilled in the Christian tradition that I'd only really encountered in bits and pieces growing up. I hadn't really recognized the fullness or encountered the fullness. And then once I did, I was able to see that that Christianity gives a much more compelling vision than the secular feminism that that I had been following. So now what I try to do in my work is to take my insider knowledge of gender theory and feminist theory but to engage with it from a Christian worldview and to help other people navigate these really thorny topics as best they can. And you were at a point in your life in your academic development, you were quite a fangirl. I mean, you, you would go to these appearances from feminist legends and just sort of, I don't know if you did the book signing thing, but it it sounds pretty close to that in, in the book. It's like, I can't believe I'm seeing one of the, I forget which, which figure it was. Judith Butler. Yeah. I think I write about that. Mm-hmm. Judith Butler. Yeah. There you go. There's a household <laughs> name in person, in the flesh and in writing down the stuff that she said, not understanding a word of it. And, and, you know, at this point in your life, doubting that it was understandable, but very certain at that point that you could decipher it later. And these were almost sacred words. Mm-hmm. You were in the thing, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what I mean when I say it was my, my religion, you know, it was the, the lens through which I saw everything. So here's a question that I had reading the, almost the admiring tone or the the wistfulness that you have for these days. And you kind of make this case as well. You say it outright in a couple of, in a couple of places in the book, but what drew you into feminism is something good, that there is something in the cluster of ideologies and the different waves that, that they, you know, cluster into that you saw as moral and right and true and correcting some some injustice in the world if you were to summarize that moral draw or that that feature of feminism that appealed to you on a visceral level as a moral being what would it be what's good about it 
feminism, I mean, broadly speaking, is responding to often very real problems in the world, right? But I think where feminism misfires is in incorrectly diagnosing the problem and the solution, right? Because if you don't have a narrative of sin and redemption, where everything is just human made, so all possibility of meaning, all possibility of redemption is solely human, and also everything that's wrong with the world is solely human, you can't help but go off the rails a little bit. So certainly, I, you know, I think there have been very real ways in which throughout human history, women's dignity has been undermined and disregarded. And there's something good in reckoning with that and seeing the ways in which women haven't been treated as fully human or allowed to really develop their full human potential in terms of education, um, in terms of contributing to society. In the early church, women flocked to Christianity because it offered them more freedom than Roman society, right? In Roman society, women are non-persons. They are owned by their husbands. Roman society has was incredibly oppressive to women, and especially women who were non-elite and who or who were enslaved or any enslaved person, right? So sex trafficking and sexual abuse was just rampant in in Roman society, and also not really seen as a problem. That's the thing; it was like condoned. So for women to have this religion that says, no, actually you're made in the image of God and you deserve dignity and you can't be used this way and you're not a non-person, I mean, that's incredibly powerful, right? And I think that's the message I was hearing or looking for, you know, in feminism, that call of justice and dignity. There's a certain point where you actually illustrate that with a an assumption or a I says a question and then an assumption that it comes out of the question that many of your peers and then later students seemed like they had, which was that gender is a performance, right? And a lot of students immediately react to that and say, yeah, yeah, it's a performance because they know that there are culturally contingent aspects of what we call gender expression, right? You actually point out that they are not understanding the depth of that claim. The real claim being made is that gender is only a performance, that there actually is nothing concrete at the bottom of it, that you could just, it, it's all just a social construct. And this was sort of the golden thread that it doesn't seem like you ever questioned and that eventually led you out of this secular feminist mindset, which is that women are real. They're not socially constructed beings from the, the clay of generic gender neutral humanity like women actually do exist as real beings that are differentiated from men and i guess on some level you and it's it turns out quite a few other feminists who we now call turfs assumed that that was the case right that there really are women and the reason we should uh, be feminist is because we want to uh, uphold the dignity of these real beings who actually exist but feminism on the whole in the mainstream has radically turned against that the idea that that women are real. Talk to us about that because it sounds counterintuitive, right? It's like feminism means standing up for women, but we don't know what a woman is. And that's at the center of the question we we open with. What's up with that? Right. So that's the central irony of feminism is that it's it's ostensibly a movement meant to defend women, but it's also very reluctant to say with any clarity what a woman is. I think that's always been a problem that's plagued feminist thought. I think it becomes more pronounced in second wave feminism. But feminism has always been very nom it's very been a very nominalist movement. So in terms of how to get out of that knot that we just talked about, where, well, we can't talk about women as a universal category, but yet we're supposed to be defending women writ large. Okay, well, how do we get out of that? We we make a nominalist claim that the word woman is a it names a category of people that because of that naming, because of that categorization, is real enough to deserve a kind of political movement. But the reason I say this this increases in the second wave is that I think the second wave feminist, feminism onward was really influenced by Simone de Beauvoir and her book, The Second Sex, which came out in 1949. She introduces the, the concept, I think, that gender would soon come to name, but she doesn't actually use the term gender in her book, right? The Second Sex. And that concept is basically that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. So she's making a distinction there between being born a female human being, but then becoming a woman, which is this much more 
you know, socially formed identity. And so she talks about that social construction process of what womanhood has come to mean. And if you read The Second Sex, especially as a woman, it's pretty clear that Simone de Beauvoir doesn't really like being a woman very much. So she writes about especially the bodily realities of femaleness in very negative terms. And part of this is her existentialist framework. So she's coming from this atheistic existentialism where there is no inherent meaning in the world and that the only meaning or the only purpose of human existence is to transcend the facts of our existence, basically, is to create ourselves, right? So existentialism reverses that essence precedes existence, like who we are is prior to our you know, particular being in the world, right? There's this universal human nature prior to my particular existence. But with existentialism, we get rid of the idea of human nature. There's only now the human condition. And so we, our purpose then is to transcend our existence and create this essence, create ourselves. And that's harder to do when you're female and you're more tied to the factual animality of being human, right? You gestate, you lactate, you do these like really gradual, very bodily things as a woman, that's kind of a drag, you know, if all you, if if your whole purpose in the world is these creative projects that you're supposed to find meaning from. So right from that point, I think from the, from really the beginning there with Simone de Beauvoir, I would say that feminism has a, a mass, ironically, a masculine bias because the ideal life is of based on male physiology. And so Simone de Beauvoir's solution to the problems that women face is essentially one kind of a Marxist utopia, but also contraception and abortion. So basically women need to be f- made free from their femaleness to be able to move and be in the world as much like men as possible. And I think that feminism since then has really, many streams of feminism have adopted that implicit masculine bias. Because our femaleness, especially female fertility, is this threat to success in the world. It's this threat to happiness. It's something that women should fear. It's something that should be tightly controlled. It's something that can undermine our autonomy and our empowerment, right? And so really that sets women at war with their own bodies. Physical realities are the things that anchor us to this concept of essence. So we, the, the classical philosophical tradition would say essence precedes existence, right? So your existential reality is lived in light of the type of thing you are, because that's what your essence is. That's, that goes all the way back to the, you know, the ancient Greeks and Christ, the Christian tradition draws this in very, very consciously as part of our metaphysics and, and theology. Well, existentialism and then feminism sounds like by extension reverses, or at least much feminism reverses this and says, existence precedes essence. So you exist, but it's up to you to decide exactly what type of thing you are. And this goes along with the idea of the the blank slate. We have no nature that determines things for us. We get to, to determine things on our nature. But there's an irony in that in order to, to hold that, as uh, Simone de Beauvoir does, it, you have to declare war against those physical realities that so anchor you and constantly obnoxiously remind you about who and what you are. And this leads to, I guess, what, what's probably the most contentious part of your, your argument or potentially difficult for a lot of people. And it is that the modern world, the way we view sexuality and the way we do sexuality actually reinforces this concept of gender, this, this diseased concept of gender constantly. And so you point to the birth control and the abortion and say, this is the result of these is that me, women can act like men. Women can begin to become men. I guess out of this, the question that emerges is, for, first of all, you know, how do we prepare ourselves to grapple with the idea that the modern world may be deeply riddled with these false assumptions and that our own habits may have to change as a result of it? You know, second, how, do we, how did we get to the point where we're ignoring our own bodies? How, how is so, such an obvious truth now something that we look at and bristle? and We say, no, I shouldn't have to be captive to those physical realities. I, as a woman, should be able to live like a man, including, you know, have promiscuous sex without, <laughs> without getting pregnant. Yeah, I think what's happened, this kind of gender revolution, is 
both conceptual and technological. And those things unfold simultaneously from the beginning. So you have these conceptual shifts happening at the time, like say Simone de Beauvoir is writing, and that's happening at the same time Margaret Sanger is at, at, at work in her wildly successful birth control movement to popularize the, the social acceptance of birth control. And so, for example, in the 1950s, when the technology for the hormonal contraceptive pill is being developed, that's the exact same technology that is used to manipulate hormones to create masculinization or feminization of the body. And so those that's the same technology, create these things. And I think one piece of what's happened is that you know, what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man, that's grounded in generativity. That's grounded in how we participate in the transmission of human existence. That's the foundation of it. Whatever kind of social interpretations there are, which do vary and are sometimes historically contingent, that's the thing that doesn't change, right? That's how all of us got here, you know, even though we have technological help now, you know, the combination of sex cells is still what's at the, the genesis of every human being. There's no other, there's no other way. And that's incredibly profound if you just sit with it for a few minutes. But I think our culture has forgotten that foundation because we no longer function that way, right? I think our society becoming contraceptive has shifted our consciousness, our cultural imagination in ways that we don't quite realize. And it's shifted the meaning or the ground of manhood and womanhood to things that are apart from generativity and the body. So things like appearance, things like external roles. So womanhood and manhood do seem like these boxes you can step into rather than this innate structure of your physiology that you can't change. So it's true. I don't. I think it's tempting to kind of maybe look askance at, at some of what's happening and say, whoa, what's wrong with those people? Or that's so crazy. But at the same time, it's part of a, a broader movement. It's it's part of this gradual technological conquest of nature that touches all of us, right, um, in different ways. And, you know, you I'm kind of looping back here, but you had mentioned the idea of gender as performance, and that's Judith Butler, her idea. And, yeah, in the book, I talk about how my students really like that idea. Like, they latch onto that, like, oh, yeah, it is a performance, right? And I think that's because for young people and increasingly for all of us, like, everything is a performance now. Everything is a performance, right? Everything is being mediated through technology, often in very public ways. And so it's intu it seems intuitively true to young people that um, what I am is, is what is performed. But what I don't think they're realizing is that the hardcore gender theorists, at least Judith Butler, would say there is no gender that's being expressed at all, but it's the expression that creates this illusion, right? So that's the thing that I, I think. I think if people really realize that's what being that's what is being said, they would reject it because most people aren't hardcore anti-realists. Most people will, <laughs> would kind of look askance at the idea that sex doesn't really exist; it's just this social construct, right? I was yeah, I was talking with a uh, well, a, a theologian recently at, at ETS, and he was pointing out that there was a he was referring to a statement on gender and sexuality that came out from a, a, a group of Christian pastors a few years back. He pointed out that the statement in its initial draft lacked any reference to reproduction, to male and female as roles in reproduction. It just spoke of them in terms of, well, roles in the household or the church or, or marriage or something like that. And, and these are obviously much easier to attack in terms of being cultural artifacts. It's, it's like you, I found this tribe in you know, East Africa that has a very different practice with regard to men and women in this area than we do in the United States. Therefore, you know, the gender binary is socially constructed. And that, that leaves it very open to that. And his critique actually resulted in this statement being modified to add in you know, the sexual differences in their roles in reproduction, <laughs> which is such a, you know, it's a massive oversight. It looks just like dumbfoundingly obvious when you think of it, but it's so easy for us as modern people to go around that little corner as screw tape might say, because we've been catechized through our, our medical regime, our way of living, the sexual morality that's, that's, that's kind of portrayed the consent ethic, all of that 
puts men and women on this plane and says, both of these creatures can behave the same sexually. There's no, no physical reality that constrains a woman to act in a way that you know, reflects her physical embodiment because, well, the reality is in our natural states, women pay a much, much, much higher price for sex physically than men do. And that reality has shaped sexual moralities for, you know, for all of time until now, because we've changed that. And we don't know, we don't realize how much that's seeped into even Christian heads, but it comes out when, you know, when we try to write statements like this. Right. It's fascinating too. Like now that, but of course, I mean, I, I had the same experience, you know, just not even seeing it, not even being aware of it. But now that I am aware of it, I, I'm just fascinated and also kind of alarmed by this collective forgetting that that's what this is about at the root. You know, it really is about generativity. Yeah. So I want to pull us back a little bit in the philosophical direction because you mentioned the the concept of postmodernism, and I promised we would kind of define that. But postmodernism has a particular relationship with words. When we say something in in postmodern circles, we are we're doing something other than making a claim about objective reality. Explain that to us, and then how that sort of feeds into the feminist train of thinking, because it's important for getting us to where words like gender now become this amorphous spectrum that nobody can actually define or, or constrain. Right. So in postmodernism, the nutshell definition is an incredulity toward meta narratives. That's what Jean Francois Lyotard defined it as. And I think that's a pretty good definition, which is basically, you know, skepticism or non belief toward stories that have explanatory power that give it an account of what the world is, why it is, and claim to be true. So certainly Christianity would be a meta narrative. Any major religion would be a meta narrative. But so also would say Darwinian scientism, for example. So postmodernism is responding to modernism. It's a critique of modernism. And there are things to critique about, you know, say the Enlightenment mentality that almost <laughs> almost overcorrected or, you know, in in terms against postmodernism. So for the postmodern, reality is primarily a construct of language. So language doesn't just name or categorize the world, but it actually creates what we perceive to be true. Now, there is something there is something true about that to an extent in the sense that language can profoundly shape our understanding of reality. And there's no better example for that than what's happening right now with all the gender stuff. It's primarily a movement that's that's linguistic. It's most strategic tool is to change language and to change words and to then create new norms about what words you can and can't say. And I think in, in many ways, because the, the idea of gender that's being offered isn't grounded in material reality, it's, it's primarily grounded in words. So there's a language game that's happening. So we all have to participate. We all have to use language the same way to create this, this what I would call an illusion but for the postmodern would be this new understanding of reality. So that's something postmodernism gets right, that language can profoundly shape our interpretation of reality. But whereas a Christian, I would push back is to say that, but reality exists nonetheless. And our, our language, our words are true insofar as they correspond to what actually exists. There's a meaning in the world, inherent meaning that we can, we can receive. And our linguistic faculty exists to help us name and understand and express that not to just create it ex nihilo, right? So one distinction I think I would make is that for the, the postmodern gender theorist, human language acts as divine language, right? Whereas in Gen the Genesis narrative, for example, it's God who can create out of nothing with words, and then human beings find, find words to name what God creates. But for the postmodern gender theorist, there is no God that's in the picture, and so we are the ones who create out of nothing with our, with our words. The response you often get to this, and, and this is, I think, one of the central turning points of the book and, and a corrective, it will be a corrective for many people's thinking on this issue. The response you typically get when you ask, what is a woman, and then expect a definite answer is that, well, whatever your definition is, somebody, some woman is going to fall outside that box. So, so if, if we say, what's a woman, and somebody answers like, you know, Matt Walsh's wife did at the uh, documentary, what is a woman? You know, what does it mean to be a female? Does it mean to have a womb, ovaries, and vagina? Is that is that actually the definition of a female? If so, what about women who've had hysterectomies? 
What about women who've had ovarian cancer and had, the, had those removed? What about people who are intersex? And you have a whole discussion about the, the whole intersex medical phenomenon and cultural phenomenon, which are quite separate in many ways in the book. What about these people? Are they women? And at, at one point in your life, you say this actually stumped you. This, this question rooted in particularities and exceptions stumped you because you had the sense that there really is a thing called woman, but there are lots of wi- people you know are women somehow who don't actually fit the part- some of the particulars. So what concept is, is missing there? And why are we right to be very suspicious toward the account that says a woman is just whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. The particulars disprove it. Right. So yeah, it did. It did used to stump me. Although it's funny, you know, just hearing you talk about that, the irony there, which is, you know, that I'm evaluating whether or not my definition of woman holds to make sure that a woman with a hysterectomy would qualify as a woman. So it's almost like I'm appealing to this meaning of woman, even as I'm trying to articulate it, right? You're also basing it off of a, a, a sense that's deeper than the definition that you know what a woman is. Right. Like this common sense definition. Like it's, I know what a woman is, but how do I articulate it in a way that includes all women? Again, that circularity. So I think the the philosophical concept that I found to be very helpful in just clarifying this is the distinction between actuality and potentiality, or sometimes it's called potency and act. You see this in Aristotle, and then Thomas Aquinas uses this distinction quite a lot in his theology. So how I would apply this to, to this debate is that I would say a woman is the kind of human being whose body is organized according to the potential to gestate new life, right? And so a woman has the inherent potential. Now, that potential might not be able to be actualized. So sometimes in this discussion, people will say, well, what about in- infertile people? But even the very category of infertility points to that inherent potentiality, right? So if a man can't get, or if a male can't get pregnant, he's not going to go to the doctor and be like, or the doctor's not going to be like, oh my gosh, you're infertile. No, he's going to be infertile if he's unable to inseminate and fer- fertilize a woman, Right. That's because it's pointing to a very specific potentiality that only he has, that only a male has, that only a female has. Like I had a, I heard a woman talking today about, or the other day about her experiences of infertility. And she was saying like how, how sex specific it was, like what she had to go through versus what her husband had to go through. Like it didn't undermine this idea that there's a sex binary. If anything, it accentuated it. Right. So if you think about potentiality, versus actuality, then, you know, my, like say my prepubescent seven-year-old daughter has this potentiality, even though it can't be actualized yet. When I hit menopause, I will still have that potentiality, even though it might not be able to be actualized. You can't have a baby anymore. You're out of the woman club. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Or, you know, hysterectomy, that's the same thing. Like, can a man have a hysterectomy? Right. So like, again, the, the very, the very like procedure of hysterectomy points back toward this, this inherent potentiality that only women share. So I do think it's actually, once you have that language or that distinction, it's actually possible to give a very straightforward definition about what a woman is that holds to, to all exceptions. Asterix, you know, disorders of sexual development, which is its own kind of complex discussion. You know, there's this fascinating phenomenon that I've seen, that we've written about it a good bit for Breakpoint, where the, the scientific materialist or the Darwinian naturalist that you mentioned earlier are actually often on the forefront of pushing back against a lot of this gender ideology because the naturalists are very acquainted with the natural world, which is, at least in the, um, the animal kingdom, is radically sexed. You know, all chordates behave this, this way. They, got the, they have the male and female set up and they do exactly the sort of thing that, that we do. There's sex differentiation and the des- and the design is very clear. I mean, the purpose is clear. They wouldn't call it design. They would call it a biological function that's evolved. But that even in that is the concept of intentionality, of a, of a telos, a purpose for male and female. And they are discernible and different, even though you can't talk to, you know, a rhesus monkey and ask him or her how they identify, you know, that's. That's irrelevant because the sex of the animal is the thing that determines its role in reproduction. Even if, like you said, an injury or a disease or old age has rendered that potential no longer actualizable. And that that holds 
true for humans as well. That's where the tension comes in because a lot of these gender theorists want to say, oh, no, no, it's all socially constructed. And anyone who knows biology says, no, it's not. It's <laughs> it's very much written into into our bodies. But that's so interesting to me because the very same biologists who would invoke those differences don't actually have the concept at work, at least not explicitly, that you're pulling on from Aristotle or from Aquinas, where they understand there is an intention, even if it's not fully realized, there is a design, even if it's not fully manifested. Yeah, I think that that they're often using the same concept, but maybe with different language, for example. Well, one other another important word I would say in the definition I gave is the structure whose body is structured as a whole, because I think that's an important piece to this too, that sex isn't just about body parts. It's about the entire organization of the body. So it's it's an all-encompassing category, right? It doesn't just influence one particular system, but all systems. Yeah. So I would, you know, I've heard some evolutionary um, scientists talk about, you know, your body map, sex is your body map, you know, and whether or not you ever actually reproduce or not, or are able to, you still have a particular body map that, you know, is, de- is again, designed, I always want to use the word, designed to produce one, either a large or a small gamete. But it's exact. you know, it's funny too, like this, there's a strange exceptionalism, right? Because, you know, the people, the, you know, the same people I think who would claim that, you know, gender is just this self-concept has nothing necessarily to do with sex. When they go to the vet, you know, they're, you know, they're not going to be like, oh, you know, doctor, what do you think my dog's gender is? You know, or it's just not your dog's male or female. You're going to need to get it neutered or spayed. You know, it's, it's this strange exceptionalism that, that somehow like, and I guess that's what evolutionary biologists realize because they tend to see humans as animals, right? Just these sophisticated animals that have kind of evolved. And that I think is actually a, a helpful counteract or, you know, it counteracts this ideology, which tries to forget that we have an animal nature altogether, that we're somehow this amazing exception in the animal world where the rules, the rules just don't hold for us. There might be a sex binary in the rest of the natural world, uh, but not for human beings. So help me understand this, because it looks like a central contradiction in the ideology of gender and the emergence of this concept, where you know feminism is about promoting the dignity and equality of women nominally. That's just that's the selling point. And yet the mo- modern gender ideology says there really is no such thing as a woman. It's it's a it's a self identification, often based on some kind of mysterious innate sense that you're uh, what you said the uh, the sex of your soul right? Is, is one way or the other. How do we get from one of these things to the other? What is the sort of genealogy that, that got us there? Or maybe just the concept, the conceptual corners that had to be turned to where we're now saying something that appears on the surface. And I guess you would, you would say much deeper than that contradicts the fundamental attitude of feminism, that women exist. Yeah. So you're hitting on an important contradiction. I think that it's helpful to clarify because one of the many confusing aspects of this conversation, not this particular conversation, but the gender conversation. <laughs> Sorry, um, guys, I know it's been a doozy. <laughs> is that there's this constant equivocation happening around the word gender. So we've been talking a lot about this kind of Butlerian gender as a performance, gender as a total social construct idea. And that that concept is definitely still in the mix you know, I'm sure anytime you have a discussion about this with someone, they'll eventually the phrase, well, gender is just a social construct will pop out. That's just a cliche at this point. But there's also this idea that you just discussed that gender is this profoundly real, almost soul, sex of the soul, you know, that, that, you know, you talked about the gender bread person, unicorn thing earlier. And, you know, if you look at those little diagrams, they'll point to the mind or they'll point to the head, and that's where gender is, right? So gender is this self-concept that not only is not just a social construct, but might actually be at odds with a child's socialization, right? So now we have this idea that a child who's a boy and who's been raised as a boy might suddenly realize he's really a girl. Well, what is what is it that he is realizing, right? Well, that's this like this gender, this very real gender. And it's so real, so profound that we have to immediately medicalize this child and begin the, the path of altering the body. So those two ideas are very different, right? Gender is just a social construct and gender is this sex of the soul. So how 
are they just contradictions? I would say that they that they are probably different ideologies or maybe different points of an ideology, which is sometimes why I don't tend to use the, the phrase gender ideology in my own work, because I think there's there's different ideologies often that are happening simultaneously. But I think what what did happen is that the anti-realism of Judith Butler. So she was, not only did she say that gender is a social construct, but she, I think her true innovation was saying that sex is a construct. So she, she kind of pushed, the, you know, pushed the, the bar even further by saying that female is a word that's a concept that's just as troubled as woman. So she asserted that not only is gender a construct, but actually the very categories of male and female are artificial. And we impose those categories on the world to make these, you know, incidental, meaningless biological distinctions seem really important so that we have to structure society around them. Now, I don't understand how she can make that argument without completely forgetting generativity. The fact that those, maybe those differences are meaningful because it's the only kind of difference that can create a new human life. That's just me. That seems like it's important. <laughs> it seems like significant maybe even perhaps the most significant difference. Um, but that's Butler's perspective. So I think what she did basically is she dethroned sex. So everything that we used to attribute or connect to sexual difference is now kind of shoved into this box of gender. And so now gender can kind of be whatever you want. But basically, I think that's the innovation there is that Judith Butler dethroned sex and now everything's about gender. But gender doesn't have this fixed meaning, which makes things even more confusing. And because most people are just, you know, when they say gender, they mean sex. Like they don't, you know, it's very hard to even navigate. I think it's really hard, I think, for the ordinary person on the street to realize what is actually being kind of shoehorned into these words and what idea of reality is is being presented. Right. This is, That's even one of the things you saw in the Walsh documentary where he repeatedly had guests or or interviewees who used the terms interchangeably. So the transgender movement is largely based on this idea that gender is very different from sex, right? That's what the gender red person says. That's what the gender unicorn says. This is a whole different concept. It's about your expression of inner, what way you feel inside, not the way your body is uh, is aligned. But all these people were using these terms loosey goosey as if they as if they mean the same things or can mean or have a, like a Venn diagram overlap. The the takeaway, I think he made explicit, but my takeaway was that none, nobody knows what they're saying. Nobody knows what's actually being claimed here. And this is where you get into the deep like theology and language of this thing. And you begin to ask questions about what language itself does. What's the significance? How is it rooted in creation? At what point do we come to a Tower of Babel scenario where we're just saying nonsense? You know, Lewis played with this in That Hideous Strength, where in the end they just start speaking nonsense because they've broken language itself. The, the counter narrative that you propose, which is Christianity with a Catholic flavor, you know, this is, this is where you've ended up and you bring to bear the riches of ca the Catholic heritage of theology of the body and so forth. But it begins in, in Genesis. And this is the, the source of the title. Genesis is rooted not only in a, in a what I'd say is a realist view of, of the world, that things really are they really do have essences. They really do exist, right? But it's also rooted in language. There's a language plays a, an interesting role here. Talk to us about that and comment on that because I think it's the very beginning of the alternative world picture that Christians can sketch in in distinction from this postmodern words mean whatever they you know whatever the power actor wants them to mean worldview. Yeah, if you if you read the first three chapters of Genesis with an attention to how language is used and also to the importance of sexual difference, I think it it really changes how those creation stories hit. We have the problem of familiarity, really, with Genesis. Certainly any Christian does, but even just in the West generally. We've just heard the story, yeah, Adam and Eve, apple, snake, gotcha, I remember. It just seems, you know, it's so, it's so familiar. We even remember things that aren't there, like the apple. <laughs> right, like, <laughs> oh, actually, it's not an apple. Yeah. So one of the things I discovered reading more creation narratives from other cultures is how weirdly elevated the, the creation of sexual differences in Genesis. There's a strange amount of attention to it. 
a lot of creation narratives, they don't even mention it at all. You know, we might get the creation of human beings, but sexual difference isn't mentioned specifically, or it might be presented as um, something bad or something that's, you know, kind of inherently oppressive from the beginning, or at least conflictual, right? That, that there's this kind of conflict between male and female, which in Genesis doesn't happen until a consequence of the fall, right? But if you look at Genesis 1 and then Genesis 2, even just if you stand back from the page and just look at when the text changes from prose to poetry, it happens twice. In Genesis 1, it happens when God creates the human beings and says, you know, let us create humankind in our own image, male and female, he created them, jumps out into poetry. And then it does the same thing in Genesis 2, when the woman is presented to the man initially, and he says, at last, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because from man she was taken, right? So both of those moments are proclaiming sexual difference, the creation of sexual difference or sexual differentiation as the culminating moment of creation, which is it's just really, really remarkable. So that's one linguistic, linguistic point I would make. But also that second story, that those are the first words a human being says in scripture, the words of, of the, the male. And they're also the first time that the words male and female are expressed, man, man and woman, ish isha in, in Hebrew. And they say something true about the nature of man and the nature of woman. They aren't just arbitrary. You know, he, he wasn't just choosing some, you know, like pretty face, you know, <laughs> I'll call you pretty face because you're pretty, right? Even that would be na- trying to name something. But he's saying something very profound, right? That in that word, it expresses both their sameness and their differentiation. So they have the same root humanness. They're both fully human. But then she is different from man and he is different from her. Right. So that name isn't arbitrary. It doesn't create that differentiation. It responds to it. So that's how you'll see human language functioning in the, especially the second creation story, that our words should respond to those essences that we've been talking about, to the natures that God creates. They should try to name them and express them and, you know, sing praises about them, right? Because that's also a cry of wonder at last, right? Because he's been going through all the animals trying to find a partner and choosing names that reflect their nature. But he hasn't been able to choose a name like this. And it's not because he couldn't think of it or he wasn't creative enough, but it's because God had not yet presented him the kind of thing that could um, elicit that name. And, and this is so beautiful and compelling precisely because it it gives us access to truths that we know intuitively and experientially on a deep level. We know that men and women are different, but that that difference is beautiful. That it's that it is manifested in a, in a framework of equality and mutual need. That the man needs the woman, the woman needs the man. And Paul, you know, the Apostle Paul does this, where he's 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 like, uh, well, woman was taken from man, but now every man is taken from a woman. There's this mutual dependence, and there's almost a this grand mysterious sense in the taking out of Adam in order to make Eve. That's what's that's what's so interesting is there's a taking out that God doesn't just pop a man and a woman into existence in the narrative. He takes the woman out of man in order to bring her back to him in a in a more independent, fully realized, conscious, and yet you know, glorified state to be reunited with him. Lewis talks about this how the he, you know he's saying it in the screw tape letters I think so it was it was written in terms of de- demonic derision. He's like this the enemy has this obsessive need to take things apart and then reunite them at a higher level in a higher fashion. But it's almost as if human beings are not just individuals, we're also a corporate thing, an entity that exists only in harmony when these two halves come together. And I, what really brought this home to me, Abigail, was something that you say in your book, but also I've also read it elsewhere. And this is an observation that's just so, it's one of those things that's so obvious, you're, you're, you're like, why have I never reflected on this and been awed by it? But here it is. Each of us has a complete body with all the organs needed to keep us alive and and metabolize and move and do all the functions of life. But we have one bodily system, which is only half. Each of us only possesses half of it. So everything works, to, you know, the circulatory, the nervous system, the, the endocrine system, all these skeletal, they all work to completeness in each of us, except for the reproductive system. 
it doesn't do anything by itself. <laughs> it requires the other half, which is located in another person's body in order to function. And how remarkable is that? What does that say about us as beings that, that we are made in order for that reunion to take place in order for full function to, to flower? Well, to me, it says that we're not complete as individuals, not in this, not in the, the most absolute sense that we actually do need each other. And this means more than just marriage. It actually, because I, I would, I would say, and it sounds like you would say as well, that sexual differences color all of our, our being. And, and there's a, there's a beautiful essay written by Alistair Roberts on men and women. And I think it's drawn from a book of his, but he talks about how even the women in Jesus life, the, the women who followed him, they met him and followed him and worshiped him and adored him in a woman's way. They did so through their embodied female sexuality, not, you know, contrary to it, not ignoring it, not becoming gender neutral, <laughs> generic human units, but as women, just as his male disciples followed him as men. It's so fascinating to me. Yeah, it's so true. And I think, I think you're hitting on something important, which is that there's many levels here. Like, first of all, there's just the obvious biological level that again, I think we need reminding of this in our in our culture, like you just described, that our our reproductive systems are actually incomplete, and that what does that? I mean, if anything, like that adds so much more significance to the sexual act, right? I mean, sometimes I think about like maybe I should maybe that's how I should teach my kids about sex. Like, well, you have you're joining your incomplete reproductive system with another person. You know, it's like whoa, that's that seems to give it a sense of like gravity, you know, t that I think we, we need. It's not just about recreation here. Well, you imply when you look at yourself in your body, you imply the other. Yes. That's, that's how you put it. And th yes. And that's the other, another level here. And that's the spiritual or even the sacramental, right? Because our bodies even, you know, it's, it's not as if you're incomplete unless you get married or something, right? But rather my femaleness is a sign of that interpersonal communion that I'm made for. That's not just realized in the marital act or in the act of marriage, but can be realized through other relationships as well. And that is ultimately a sign of the nuptial nature or the nuptial bond between God and humankind, right? So our, our sexual difference is a sign of our ultimate fulfillment in communion with God, right? So that's one reason why humankind is characterized as feminine in the Christian tradition, as bride. And that is because in that nuptial metaphor, in that sacramental understanding of our bodies, we are made to receive the love of God and make it fruitful, right? And that, and my body map, my femaleness is a sign of that, that ultimate reality, which I think is so profoundly beautiful. Abigail, you know, this, this has been amazingly rich, but also frustrating because there's so much we can't get to. But I think this is probably an important place to land because I want to, I want to be very careful not to, and this is one of the things I would critique about a lot of the conservative treatments or right-wing treatments of this subject, right? I, I want to be careful not to just point fingers to the left to go, oh, those feminists, those postmodernists, those progressives, and their silly ideas, we've got it all figured out and we're not participating in this craziness. We're, <laughs> you know, we're based trad folks and, and we don't, we don't, uh, partake of that. Well, Here's where the here's where the pain points hit and your book makes the case for them with absolutely no apologies as a Catholic, right? What are what are the hard things that we're going to have to think about as conservatives, as Christians, as uh, people who believe in a biblical worldview in our own lives that may need to change because of this? And I'm thinking I'm thinking especially of the the birth control regimen that has really become taken for granted. And not just that, but the, the things that come out of it, the things that we assume because of it, about the differences between men and women and the way we can behave. What are the pain points? What do we need to think about? And how do we need to put a mirror in front of ourselves and say, you know, you're the chief of sinners? Yeah, I think absolutely you need to rethink contraception. <laughs> and I would say this not just to, you know, evangelical Christians, but I would also say this to women more generally. You know, I think one of the huge costs of our society becoming a contraceptive society 
is that we've pathologized women's fertility and we've we've made women's bodies the problem, right? So it's just expected that young women will usually take a hormonal intervention to disrupt their normal physiology indefinitely, right? Because her fertility is an inconvenience. So I think we have to be, we have to think about technology and bodily technology that works in harmony with our nature versus that actually tries to work at odds with it. And that's, that's why, that's why um, birth control, especially hormonal birth control is, is different than say the fact that I wear like contact lenses, right? That's a technological intervention that is restoring a defect. Restoring potential. Yeah, exactly. It's actualizing the potential, right? So I think not only has that been bad for women, but I think it's, I mean, if you do read Humanity Vitae, you know, Pope Paul VI makes these predictions about what our culture will be like if we embrace birth control. And he reads like a freaking prophet, you know, especially how he says that women will become more devalued and sexually objectified. And that absolutely has happened, right? Because sex has become cheap, right? So I do think that now how, what we do now, I mean, we can't like unring a bell like that's, but at the same time, I do think that there are fertility-based awareness methods of, ma- of family planning that not only I think are more like theologically and biblically sound, but also more physiologically healthy. And I think as a woman have restored a sense of, of knowledge, first of all, like I understand how my body works now, which being put on a pill never helps you to really understand your body. It actually helps your body not to work like it's supposed to. I've found moving away from that in my own life. And I was on the pill for years too. So I know both sides. Um, I know what it's like, but being on birth control, I think alienated me from my own, my own physiology. And what's interesting is I'm, I'm looking around now that there are secular feminists who are making this argument. Like a book just came out called the case against the sexual revolution. And it's making some of the same arguments that I'm making here about wow, maybe we need to take a second look at how contraception has shaped our culture, has shaped our sexual ethic, has shaped specifically how we think about men and women. So I think there's definitely a lot a lot to discuss on that front, a lot to mull over. I love another comment that Lewis makes in Mere Christianity about sexuality and, and the Christian sexual ethic. And he's, he's prefaced that by saying, this is not where the center of sexual ethics lies, but it's very important. To Christian sexual ethics. And the reason I think we need to pay close attention to this, he says, is that, is that the uh, sexual impulse seems to be one that has been uh, particularly damaged by the fall to where most of our impulses drive us to seek the thing we need and then to, to stop at the point where we've achieved what we need. So, you know, food, we, we, most of us, a normally functioning healthy person will seek as much food as he or she needs. And then once the need is fulfilled, stop eating. He says sex is aggravated to preposterous excess of the function to where he says if a, you know, if the average man indulged his sexual impulse every time he, he felt like it and every act resulted in a child, then he, he said in a couple of years, he could populate a small village. And this, this idea that we should have to place restraints on our sexual desires, that we actually have to bridle these passions and direct them toward a rational end is one of the deep claims of Christianity. And that claim hits, you know, both men and women, but obviously in the ancient world, it's going to, it's going to hit men really hard. It's like, not only do you have to be faithful to one woman, but you actually have to accept her in her entirety, which includes her fertility and your fertility. (laughs) And this is, this is a part of the picture, which in, in, you know, from the Catholic perspective means that, and from the historic Protestant perspective, I might add, means that you have to be willing to restrain your sexuality if you're not willing to accept the full fruits of what you're doing meaning children. That's, uh, that's, uh, that puts a cramp in our style, you know, that tends to rub us the wrong way. And yet this is what God demands of us. But, but isn't it beautiful that we're being asked to treat people as whole persons instead of as just objects of pleasure, instead of just a means to achieve, you know, whatever feeling we're, we're looking for. That's, that's something that weighs heavily on my conscience. And I think should, should at least cause every Christian who is who has taken modern assumptions for granted to pause and stop and think, what have I bought into here? And is this 
all okay and is this god honoring and it doesn't follow the original design that he you know he set up for humans yeah i think that the embrace of contraception has created a kind of default mentality that women should be sexually available on demand and unfortunately i think that's not that different than you know the what i heard about sex growing up you know it's like don't have it till you're married but then after marriage there's this implicit you 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 need to be sexually available on demand right and there's there's something really demeaning about internalizing that as a woman i think so for me kind of moving beyond that and practicing a kind of family planning where i'm where i'm in tune with my own body and that my husband also participates right because he exercises self restraint we both do um depending on whether we want to avoid or or try to go for a pregnancy and it's actually been a really beautiful part of our marriage because you take it for granted, you know, again, I, I mentioned this kind of like sex is cheap now. And I think there's something to that, like the, you know, we've lost the kind of gravity of, of what it actually is and the importance of it, because we want to make it available as, as much as possible. And it's not just Christianity that proposes an ethic of, of self-restraint and self-control and continence, but all ancient wisdom, right? I mean, that's another thing that's shifted in the modern times post Freud really is that no happiness comes, you know, that's that classic understanding of virtue is repression and we shouldn't repress. I just wrote an article about Sto like neo stoicism, it coming back and becoming popular again. Right. And the, the central tenet of stoicism is self restraint and that you have to exercise virtue and that's how you get the good life, not right. by indulging your passions. Exactly. Because they, they rule you, you know, that's the thing. If you don't, if you don't learn how to master your passions, then they will master you. And I think our culture has basically said, that's okay. We, we want to be mastered by our passions. Our economy runs on it. So let's let human desire, you know, run amok. Yeah. Well, there's so much more to talk about here, Abigail. Um, your book is is rich, as I said. It's uh, dense in the sense that there's so much uh, ground covered in so little time. And we just didn't get to all the concepts. But I want to leave you with this or ask this question to leave our, our listeners with. If they're fascinated by this discussion and they want to dive deeper into it, but they're not sure how to begin to talk to other people about it. What is one question that you would have them ask someone who buys all the modern implicit assumptions about gender being, a, you know, the preferable concept to, to sex? So, you know, a question that would open the door without offending someone, but could get them thinking very easily. What, what would that be? Uh, I wish I had this like silver bullet question, but I guess I would say ask for definitions of terms. As soon as someone uses the term gender, do not proceed in the conversation before asking them what they mean by gender. And see if you can kind of pin them down on it because my guess is, like I mentioned before, you'll see equivocation. You know, you'll see people conflating them. And so I think being honestly curious, not like this gotcha kind of way, but honestly pointing out like, well, wait, so gender is, wait, I'm confused. So gender is a social construct, but it's also this inner self concept, like, you know, what, you know, just try to tease into the, the way people are using words and ask for definitions of words. And eventually, pretty quickly, you'll come to a contradiction. And it's, it's really helpful if like, the conversation kind of leads that person to realize the contradiction before you point it out to them. But that's what I would say, ask for definitions. That's excellent. Really helpful. My guest today has been Abigail Favalli, professor of the practice at the McGrath Institute at Notre Dame University and author of The Genesis of Gender. Dr. Favalli, thank you so much for joining me today on Upstream. I've enjoyed this and uh, I actually learned a lot. Yeah, this was, this was a blast. Thank you. Upstream is a program of the Colson Center. When it comes to the hardest questions we ask, we have thousands of years of accumulated wisdom from which to draw from a faith that is the explanation of all reality. So come upstream and learn to understand the world, the church, and the God who has placed you in them. Connect with us on social media or find more resources at upstream.colsoncenter.org.